today. I'm just going to pause the, um, the share while I introduce myself. I'm Katie Finnamore and I'm hosting today's session. Um, many of you will recognise me if you're in your final year, business, uh, accounting, economics, finance, etc. Um, if you don't, I'm one of the careers and employability consultants. I mainly work with Plymouth Business School, but I also work with our international students and postgraduate taught uh, amongst others. Um, so as I say, I'll be hosting today's session. Um, this session today, as you can see, let me just reshare my screen, is our um, careers in accounting, economics, banking and finance panel. So a really good opportunity for you to um, hear some more about the sector, build your commercial awareness, which is your understanding of um, certain businesses or um, the finance sector more broadly, um, challenges, opportunities, gain some top tips from our speakers. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. And um, a big thanks to our speakers, Vicky, Ross and Jonathan. I'm not going to introduce them because they will be doing that themselves in more detail shortly. Um, you do have an opportunity to ask questions at the end of each speaker's session. So if you have a look at the brochure beforehand, you'll see that each speaker has 15 minutes. That's kind of 10 minutes to, to talk about their experiences themselves, what they do, et cetera. And then five minutes or so for questions. So do feel free to have some ready uh, and you can either unmute at the end of the talk and we'll take questions that way, or you can pop them in the chat and I'll field them as well. Um, I would ask that you, if you're not one of the guest speakers, please stay muted during the main session uh, until we're at the question point. Um, if you do want to have your cameras on, though, please do, because I think it can be quite daunting as a speaker to be talking to a blank sea of names and nothing else. Um, but the session is being recorded, so just to be aware of that as well. Um, I think that's everything. As I say, do check in uh, if you are... Uh, an ECN or ACF 6001 student and I'm going to pass over to our first speaker which is Vicky who is the audit director at KPMG so uh, Vicky thank you so much for joining us and the floor is yours Thank you, Katie. Thanks very much. Um, good to uh, meet you all. I would say see you all, but I can't see many faces at the moment. So I uh, hope there's a few people out there that I'm talking to. So as Katie said, I'm uh, Vicky Sewell. I'm an audit director for KPMG and I'm based in the Plymouth office for KPMG, although I'm not originally from the southwest. Um, I moved down here quite a few years ago and we have a office here that works across the southwest up to Bristol. Um, so I wanted to just cover a couple of things today, having been asked to present um, on the uh, session and the panel today. So I was going to talk a little bit about my career in audit and how I got to where I am now, um, what it's like working in audit and why I've stayed in that profession for so long. How can you get into accountancy? So looking forward post your um, degree qualification and then also thinking a little bit about beyond the accounting qualification and, and what that opens up for you in terms of sort of career choices. So coming back to my career in audit, um, I did a business economics and accounting degree. I knew that I wanted to become an accountant. Um, many people sort of laughed at me at that age, knowing that was what I wanted to do. But I was absolutely clear that I wanted a qualification in accountancy. I didn't really think much beyond that at that time, but I knew um, that was the, the sort of first goal, the first step in my career journey. Um, after university, I did actually apply for um, an audit training position with a number of different firms of accountants um, and first got a training contract with a mid-tier firm. But I decided at that point, actually, that rather than going straight into a career, I was going to go traveling. So I did take a year out. Um, and it was a bit of a, I mean, it was an amazing thing to do, fantastic thing. And although I'm not here to talk about it, I highly recommend taking some time out before you get into your chosen career. Um, but for me, unfortunately, there was a recession very similar to what we're going through at the moment. Um, and although I'd managed to defer my place with the mid-tier accounting firm, while I was away traveling, they decided that they weren't going to recruit as many people as they had envisaged when they when I went through the application process. And so unfortunately, I didn't have a job to come back to. 
but I did manage to get a job with a small firm. And, and that's one of the things to come across, I think, for me, is that um, there are plenty of opportunities out there. If you want to become a qualified accountant, it's not just about the big firms like KPMG. And obviously, I'm here to talk about KPMG, but there are other routes and other opportunities. Um, I trained with a small firm, spent my sort of first three years of my audit life with that firm, and then moved on to a mid-tier firm in London. And I worked in London for a year before deciding that actually working in London wasn't for me. The opportunity and the experience of the audits I was working on was absolutely fantastic. And I'll come on to a little bit of that when I talk about what it's like working in audit. Um, but it wasn't for me in terms of the commute. Um, and so I then joined KPMG as a qualified accountant. Um, so I already had two years post qualification experience of working in audit. And so I came into the audit team as um, an assistant manager. Um, and then I've stayed in audit for the remainder of my career. But it hasn't been something um, that, you know, I've done plenty of different things as part of that career and part of the promotion and part of my self sort of career aspirations has involved going on secondment, working in different sectors with different teams within the audit department within KPMG. And I've worked in three different offices, so I haven't always worked in Plymouth. I've worked in the southeast, um, in two offices in the southeast as well. Um, I've stayed in audit. And um, for me, that has been very much about the opportunities and the people that I've worked with throughout my career. I have worked with a number of amazing organisations. Um, and for those of you that are very, very into your accounting and audit and financial statements, you may have noticed my signature on the University of Plymouth audit uh, report for the financial statements a few years ago. So when KPMG were the auditors, I was the, um, the audit RI who was leading the work that we were doing with the university. So now what it's like, what is it like working in audit? So for me, um, no day is the same. And I think that's true, whether you're a new joiner or someone in the position I'm working in now. You work with a variety of organisations. So the responsibility of the auditor is to sign off on the financial statements. And that involves really digging into the finances of that organisation. It really does require a lot of teamwork, whether that's with the audit team you're working with or whether it's with the, the client finance team that are providing that information to help you complete the audit work. You need great team around you, great communication skills, a really good ability to build relationships because you are working with a lot of different people and problem solving and resilience are really key to, to doing well in, in, a, in the auditing profession. Every day, as I say, is different. And as the most junior member of the team up to the most senior member of the team, you will be dealing with people from across the organisation. So one day you might find yourself in the office of the finance director and the next day you might find yourself in the stock room talking to someone who's looking after the stock and making sure that um, the stock is being sort of maintained and held in the right place in the right way. And then the next day you could be talking to the purchase ledger person who's responsible for paying all the invoices. And so you have to sort of learn to adapt and deal with those different situations. Um, it also gives you an opportunity to see a huge number of um, organisations and what they do. And that gives you some sort of guidance, I suppose, as to how you might want to take your career forward. I, as I say, stayed in audit, but I've worked with organisations from universities such as Plymouth through to um, housing associations, uh, companies that build offshore drilling platforms, uh, companies that provide online training services, um, charities that provide um, support to people suffering with cancer, to children in need, to sort of name one that everyone knows and is very topical for today, obviously being the uh, Children in Need Friday. So how did I get into, oh, sorry, so how can you get into accountancy? So there's a lot of routes. Obviously, for me, it's very much about the KPMG route today. So we offer lots of different opportunities for graduates. You can come into audit like I did and study for your um, Institute of Chartered Accountants in England and Wales qualification, so the ACA qualification. You can come into tax and qualify for it and study for a certificate in finance, accounting and business. And then on top of that, you complete your tax qualifications. 
or you can come into some of our other teams like audit technology, consulting, deal advisory, all of which give you some form of accountancy or finance qualification. The audit technology is a really big growth area at the moment. It is something that um, as auditors is a very interesting and challenging time for us because we're using more and more technology in the audits that we perform. And so you don't have to be an IT um, specialist to be able to work in the technology team. And certainly as an auditor, although you need some element of IT experience, I've got to hold my hand up and say I'm not the best in the world, but but we do use a lot of IT now and therefore it's a great opportunity to see what we can do to, uh, to really improve our audits and make things as efficient as possible. You don't have to join an audit firm. I suppose that's the other thing. You know, to become a, a qualified accountant, you could go and work in a finance team uh, you could start that journey working in a finance team and, and earn your qualification through experience and practical experience rather than through experience from being an auditor and providing audits. So what about beyond the qualification? What, what does it sort of bring you in terms of that future career and, and sort of opening up doors and opportunities for you? Well, um, for me, I've undertaken a couple of secondments within KPMG. So often if you're working for an audit firm, there will be opportunities post-qualification to branch into all sorts of other areas. That could be going into tax or technology. It could be, as I've done, going into the real sort of technical team that sit behind our auditors and provide that technical support when it comes to thinking about how you account for things and what the finances, financial standards are and so on. Um, there's also opportunities to do secondments abroad. So for KPMG particularly, we have a worldwide network. And so we have opportunities for short and long term secondments abroad. Um, one of our graduates who recently qualified has just done three months in Australia on secondment in the Australian audit practice. Um, others have got on secondment to Australia and the US in a variety of different roles and chosen to stay and have made that secondment a permanent um, move. Within KPMG itself, there are opportunities to move out of the pure accounting areas and move into consultancy um, and to those other services that we provide. And then obviously you can move out into industry. One of the biggest benefits for me of working in audit has been the different organisations I've seen, the different finance teams I've seen. And it's given me a great insight into um, you know, what's out there in terms of finance careers. We have a number of our alumni who've gone out of audit into industry, joined a finance team and are now finance directors, CFOs um, and even chief execs of different organisations because they have been able to take their accounting qualification into that world and, and to continue to further their career. So, and then obviously you can stay in audit. Um, for me, that's been the, the chosen route, um, mainly because I enjoy the variety and the people that I work with. But whatever you do, once you've got that accounting qualification, there is a world of opportunity out there for you, absolutely. So thank you very much. I don't know if you've got any questions for me. That's brilliant, Vicky. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I come from a family of accountants and they all work for completely different businesses doing different things too. So it's uh, it's really interesting to hear you talk about that as well. Um, I know consulting is always a popular route for students as well. They're always asking about that. So nice to know that um, there are other ways into it than just going straight into it after graduation as well, amongst other things. Yeah. Um, are there any questions anyone would like to ask Vicky? Like I say, either feel free to unmute or pop them in the chat if so. I'm guessing uh, you kind of graduated around 2008 then from what you said about the recession, Vicky. Um, I would love to say that was the case, but it was a little bit um, before then, to be oh. honest. <laughs> but thank you very much. <laughs> You're welcome. Pleasure. <laughs> Um, okay, we've got a question from Jenny. So um, you mentioned that no auditing, uh, sorry, within auditing, no day is the same. Uh, do you think the role gives more variety than accountancy more generally? So I, I mean, I, I think my answer to that would be be yes. Um, uh, many years ago now, I did a secondment into a finance team, and I worked within a finance team preparing the management accounts for a um, an insurance company, and. Um, for me, whilst there, there are definitely things that come up in your day to day work, if you're working in a finance team, often there is a routine to that 
um role because there will be something you have to do each day something you have to do each week something you have to do each month with audit because we tend to work in blocks of time so an audit is normally broken up into three stages sort of planning the field work and then the completion um, but because you're working with different organizations I could be one day I'm planning for an audit with one entity the next day I'm reviewing a set of accounts because I'm getting near the end of an audit and then the next day I'm out on site with my team who are completing the field work on another audit and so I'm sort of dealing with different entities at different stages um, and then quite often you get a phone call from you know the finance director telling you that they're going to be doing some transaction or they're looking to grow their business in some way and therefore you've got something that sort of drops in that is completely unexpected that you've got to then advise them on in terms of the accounting and what the implications are for the audit now that's me obviously at that sort of higher level but for, even for the sort of more junior members of the team although you'll be out perhaps on site doing an audit um, and you have certain jobs that you have to do even doing a bank reconciliation so looking at the bank account and, and reconciling that to the financial records will be different for every single audit that you do because some will have fantastic records and it will be easy some will have terrible records and it will be really challenging. Um, some will have, um, you know, sort of difficulties just even getting the information for you. So you're constantly sort of having to problem solve and think about different things because you're not sat working with the same system or team every single day of the year. Brilliant, thank you. And um, do you think, is there like one tip you wish you'd have known kind of when you first graduated or one thing you wish you'd done that would have like because I'm assuming you you know you're very happy with where you are now but is there one thing you think would have like helped fast track you or just that you would have had more confidence in perhaps uh, or something that was a turning point you didn't notice at the time that was later uh, I think for me actually I I was very focused when I was at university on applying to the the bigger firms um, and as I mentioned, you know, I had a bit of a hiccup in that sort of journey because although I got a job with a mid-tier, I ended up with a smaller firm. Um, and I think I would go back and say to myself, actually, that didn't matter how you get your training, whether it's a small firm, a mid-tier, a large tier. I don't think really matters. It's about how much you put into it in terms of that study and thinking about yourself in terms of where you want to go the next step. I always look back and think, I had an interview with KPMG when I was at university and I was rejected from that from joining them on their training program. Um, and then when I joined them as a qualified member of staff, I sort of felt, well, do you know what? Actually, I got here. It didn't matter that it took perhaps a slightly more circuitous route than some of my peer group. But I still managed to to get to that job that I wanted at the very start of my career. And so I would tell myself, don't beat yourself up too much. If you know if things don't go to plan and you don't get the first job, then there, something else will come up and you will always get there if you are willing to put the time in yourself. That's a brilliant tip and a brilliant lesson. Yes, <laughs> sharing that. And I guess actually it may have benefited you to do the route you did because you know more about a wider breadth of businesses and how they work, which obviously would be helpful for, for what you do in auditing. Absolutely. Um, and to be honest, I, I'm a great advocate now. And I, as I say, I probably shouldn't be saying this because I'm here to try and get you all to apply to KPMG. <laughs> but, you know, working in a small firm gives you a really different perspective to a large firm. And you also work with much smaller organizations because that is the nature of it normally a smaller audit firm will be working with smaller firms whereas obviously the likes of KPMG work with much larger organizations and so as a result I had much more hands-on experience when I was in my first early days of auditing because quite often it would be a box of books that arrived and you had to audit that. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Vicky, thank you so much. That's been absolutely wonderful. Um, are you staying with us for the rest of the session or do you need to head off to do um, important things? <laughs> no, I'm I'm happy to stay on. I'll probably turn the camera off and just sit and listen. But if there's any other questions, then I'm happy to, uh, to um, yeah, to participate in the questions later if anyone thinks of anything else. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you very much indeed. So uh, just trying to find my reactions on my thing. I can't find it. It's my, my screen. <laughs> but round of applause. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. Michael. Excellent. 
And guys, you do have um, Vicky's details to connect with her on LinkedIn if you would like. So, um, you know, please do take advantage of that um, really great opportunity to get to know um, her better and talk to her about any other questions you might have. Thank you. OK, so uh, we've now got Jonathan Hadida, who is from McColl's uh, and Morrison's Retail Group. So, Jonathan, thank you so much for joining us. And um, I will hand over without further ado, because you're going to introduce yourself as part of the talk. Sounds good. Thank you, Katie. Thank you. Uh, morning, everyone. I hope you're all well um, and looking forward as I am, got to be honest. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to talk to you basically about um, live as a buyer, really. Um, so the pros, cons, how did I get there? Um, it's not a particularly typical route for an economist, um, but I felt actually it drew upon my skill set quite well. And actually, I do use more of my degree in the role than I sort of perhaps thought I would at the start. Um, so I'm going to be brave and try and screen share this. And let's hope it works. We're here for tech support if you need it. <laughs> it looks good. <laughs> Right, can you all see that? Lovely stuff. Okay, so um, yeah, so my name is Jonathan Hadida um, and I am a buyer for McColl's Retail Group who are now part of uh, Morrison's. So Morrison's acquired the business a couple of months ago, um, but I'm still working within the McColl's part. So to give you some kind of background, um, I studied economics at Plymouth um, and I did a year in industry as well. Um, so I also did sort of um, like a year as a buyer in that industry year, which is what kind of sparked my interest um, for doing it full time afterwards. So I graduated in 2020. So I had the uh, fun time with the pandemic of doing all my essays at home and not having a library and my friends and meal deals. Um, but actually, it really, it was a real turning point because it sort of had a big effect on my plans because I'd initially planned to work really hard in final year try and get the best grade I could and then go off and have a great time traveling before I sort of got into work. Um, but for obvious reasons, that wasn't possible with the pandemic. So I kind of had to have a bit of a rethink about what I really wanted to do, um, which is why I sort of, I gave myself a bit of time off. I think I had like a month off where I just basically didn't do anything. Um, and then I got sort of job searching and stuff to think about what I'd like to do because I've realized that the pandemic was going to be on for a while and I probably shouldn't just lie about watching TV and sponging off her parents. So, um, I came across this grad, uh, grad scheme with McCall's. So McCall's are a convenience retailer um, and they've got about 1,100 stores all sort of spread out within the UK. Um, and I came across this graduate scheme where it was a two-year scheme and it was basically split up into different rotations. So you had six months um, in the commercial team for the route I went down, which was a commercial graduate scheme. Um, and then you had these sort of rotations in really different areas, so like HR, finance operations and then you had your final nine months back in your kind of core department which for me was commercial um, and the reason I sort of picked that was I didn't really know what I wanted to do I knew I sort of liked buying and I had an interest um, in the commercial world but I didn't really know what I wanted to do and I think it's really important to sort of just be open at such an early stage of your career to everything because I might have even though I thought maybe the commercial world was best gone and done some work in like operations for example and thought oh no I, I really like operations I think I'm going to stick with that because we did have an opportunity afterwards to basically say what our preference was um so it was actually the first time McCall's had done a scheme and they'd set it up because their aim was to kind of nurture internal talent um, and develop a new wave of what they called future leaders and I know that this is quite popular amongst sort of other businesses like Unilever, GSK, Mars I know they're sort of big schemes um and I think the reason it really appealed is I wanted to work somewhere where the progression opportunities were like available for one, because they're not always so sort of clearly available. And B, they were really clearly mapped out. So from the moment I basically spoke to them, they said, this will be your kind of route throughout the business. Um, and that's quite encouraging when you're sort of a young person who's just gone through a pandemic, like just trying to get a role and already even has got this career route mapped out. So that really appealed to me. Um, so now I've come off the scheme. Um, as of six months ago and my current role is I'm the buyer of frozen ice cream and produce or the fruit and veg um, for McCall's um, and to be honest I, I wasn't even 100% sure about just going into a buy role even after the scheme in terms of the reason I relate the reason I wanted to actually come on this is because I can relate to it so much in terms of even now I actually really don't know what I want to do like 100% it's not that I'm actually like so set on buying 
Um, and it's actually it's useful for me to kind of almost hear other people come on and speak about it so I can give my sort of view. But it's actually that my point is that going on to like a graduate scheme, which I probably advocate for, is you get this exposure to other things. So I know that, for example, like I actually really enjoyed my time in operations and I quite liked the practical side of it. So it's worth sort of bearing in mind that you don't always have to go down such a niche route. What you can do is think about something that offers you um, broader exposure, which will also probably stand you in good stead in the long run. If you're looking at maybe more of a senior role where you're overseeing things, if you've got exposure in different areas, you're more likely to be considered for it. So <clears throat> what does a buyer sort of entail? Um, the cliche kind of day in the life. Um, and why did I kind of use it? So I basically thought that my skill set was quite well applied to buying. Um, I'm quite chatty, as you probably noticed at this point. Um, I like sort of meeting new people, um, like negotiating, that sort of thing. I find it all really kind of interesting. Um, and I also thought I could apply my degree in this area. So I'll go into more detail with it later. But sort of having that economics and business background meant that I sort of understand maybe what's going on in a wider context a bit more. Um, which really helps my job when you're talking about sort of price increases for products that I'm buying and that sort of thing. You kind of understand like inflation and that sort of thing, um, which I'm sure you guys will be familiar with as well. So just to quickly whiz you through it, um, the kind of main things I do are managing our supplier relationships. So like I said, from price increases, which we've had plenty of this year with the current state of the economy and inflation that everyone will be aware of, hopefully anyway, um, or quality problems that might appear and then we have customers maybe complain so I have to sort of take those up directly um, managing the range so sort of constantly trying to reevaluate it to make sure I've got the right products in the right stores and also the right prices which is particularly important at the moment with obviously cost of living crisis we've got going on um, and then look at performance so tracking which of my products are performing which ones aren't um, and then maybe look at some of my sales initiatives so what I'm putting on promotion and is that driving sort of more profit than if I didn't have it on promotion um, and then also a big one for me is trying to drive our improvement um, across the waste in the business. So being the buyer for fruit and veg, I obviously have quite a lot of waste because fresh food does just waste at quite an astronomical way. Um, right. Sorry. So for me, that's really looking at um, targeting it to the core in terms of are we ordering too much? Like is the customer demand there? Can we kind of balance it? Is it just that I need different products? People don't like this, but they like that. Um, because if you can increase your sort of um, customer proposition, I suppose, then you'll be able to reduce the waste ultimately and increase your profits. Um, and I'm actually heading up a, a waste initiative at the moment for the business, which is really drilling into the sort of detail of um, how we can essentially optimize the selling price we're selling for. So almost like the maximum price people would pay and be happy with, but anything that doesn't sell at that price, we're giving it to charity. Because I do feel somewhat obligated that as a buyer of so much volume, um, I feel some sort of moral responsibility to actually make sure this doesn't go in the bin. Um, and it's something that I took up quite strongly when I joined the grad scheme. And look, I could physically see the numbers that went in the bin. I felt almost quite guilty about it. So I'm trying to really utilise my position to push forward th with that and make a bit of a difference there. Um, and then the last one is, is probably the most important part of my role. So it's quite a tough one and, and someone has to take one for the team, but trying to supply samples is uh, necessary in terms of, I have to make sure that the stuff that's in the stores, you know, it tastes okay and that people might like it. So I have had the pleasure of trying some quite nice ice cream samples from time to time, a couple of magnums here and there, that sort of thing. Um, <laughs> so that is probably one of the perks of the jobs, I have to admit. And then I just wanted to do a bit around employment. Um, so it's probably quite broad, but kind of how to prepare what worked for me and things I wish I knew, um, which are still very much relevant to me to the day. So in terms of how to prepare, this might sound like quite a broad point, but I genuinely think you need to almost conduct a whole like self-analysis. And what I mean by that is really trying to work out what you want to do, like start from the fundamental. So almost not thinking what job do I want? You sort of strip it back to the absolute basics and just think, do I want to go into work? Do I want to maybe do further education? Do I want to travel? Because that's the important bit. And then when you nail that, you can look into the detail a bit more. Because like I said earlier, I, I sort of intended to travel, but then it wasn't possible. So I had to go, ah, do I want to do a master's? Do I want to work? And I really struggled over which one. 
um to the point i i literally had to write like a list of pros and cons of like masters job like i had everything going on talking to my family about it chewing their ear off about seven times a day so it's really important that you actually do think what it what is the general direction i want to go into um and then once you've sort of come to your conclusion on that you have to think about like doing this skills assessment so do you need certain modules or we need a master's something that you want to go into for example because that is going to save you a lot of pain down the line if you sort of suddenly realized it after you hadn't really considered that um it might delay you a little bit so you don't need to put too much pressure on it because like i said you, none of us i think at the end of the day know 100 percent what we want to do forever but it's important to kind of try and think as much as possible and that will save you pain down the line um, and then in terms of uh, experience so get as much work experience as you can um, that sort of goes without saying um, any online skills courses that you can do in, in previous CV um, and then coming on to uh, the CV point so getting it checked by experts so I know there's the career service at uni that do it I'm hoping they still do it because I used it and it was really useful yeah Katie's nodding so <laughs> I'm assuming they do um, and then practicing interviews I think that's really important because if you can kind of master that even if maybe you change industry if you're just good at interviewing that's a really strong skill set and it will basically determine whether, obviously whether you get the role so there may you may be slightly less good even potentially at a role than someone else but if you're so good at interviewing that you know the right things to say then you're going to be the one who gets the role um, and then it's important to think about any specifics. So, for example, like psychometric tester, uh, testing, they do a lot of that for grad schemes. So I had to do some of that. Um, so I tried to get myself well practiced so that you don't really find it daunting when you actually do it. Um, and then the last point, which I think is really important, actually, is make sure you just research the companies you're applying for. Um, and the reason I emphasize this so much is I got tested so much on this when I applied for my calls, like more than I sort of expected to um i think companies really like to know that it wasn't just a kind of blanket application and that you've really looked into their culture their values um and this is a bit of an odd thing but what i like to do is try to find a really weird fact about the company that not many people would know and then i try and squeeze it in somewhere in the conversation so i'm not directly asked about it but i try and just say oh yeah like when you blah 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 like because what what that does is not only does it show you've done research and it looks like you've probably done more than other people because it's so peculiar and it's not just the kind of headline thing of oh x amount of profit income that sort of thing but actually you become really memorable because the interviewer's like yeah he's the one who like knew that like very like obscure fact um so i think that's a good one if you want a, a sort of tip um and i did use that in my cult's interview i have to admit um and then in terms of what works for me so work experience in sort of different businesses um, and industry kind of gave me confidence and helped me find out what I like. So I think the big one on this was doing a placement year um, was really important in terms of I understood that I liked buying um, and it was something that sort of my skill set was aligned to and something I was interested in. So that helped me to kind of consolidate when I realised I wasn't going to go travelling. I, I instantly thought, OK, I'll look at buying jobs or at least like grad schemes, like along the commercial route. Um, and then this is somewhat controversial because I know a lot of employers are not very keen on recruiters, but I think it's important to say that for me, going through a recruitment agency um, really sort of helped me because it took a lot of the stress and burden um, out of finding jobs myself. They're very obviously well in touch with what's going on in the job market and they can really help you. Sort of a half an hour call with a recruiter where you've like sent them your CV, you just talk about like what you like to do. They can save you so much time. Um, and this is actually how I got the McColls role. So it wasn't publicly advertised. It was only through this particular recruiter that I just happened to ring up anyway, that they were advertising it. So I wouldn't even be standing here talking about it if I hadn't gone through this recruitment agency. Um, so I think it's worth basically applying to um, scheme as well through those recruiters, because you also narrow the kettle of fish a little bit, because it's only people going through that recruiter. So I'd say continue looking obviously everywhere indeed um i'm trying to think where, what other websites there are but there are obviously lots but then also going through a recruiter so they can bring you um jobs um and then just the last point was things i wish i knew so this is very basic and blanket statement but don't stress over finding the perfect role because 
it does just come with experience and I think if you apply to lots of different opportunities that's the best thing you can do because even if you don't like something you're in you'll know that you now don't like that and you won't be pondering it so it will sort of eventually you'll get guided to what you like doing you'll sort of think I liked that part of the role in that job I didn't like this bit so much so you can kind of narrow it down until you find there probably isn't a perfect role let's be honest but you will find a, a role that is most suitable for you um and like I said to be honest this is something I still think about myself with am I definitely in the right role for me like could I be better off either like financially or like in terms of well-being so it is something that we're always thinking about um but yeah I would say don't stress because I think eventually you will kind of just fall into the role that you're meant to be in um and that will be that so yeah thank you very much for listening if anyone has any questions I'd love to hear them that's great Jonathan thank you very much I must admit I got caught up in a daydream of buying Ben and Jerry's for a living (laughs) which sounds great um we do have a question in the chat um uh, Sarah would like to know what was your weird fact that you managed to wangle into the interview (laughs) oh okay so it tested me that because it was a couple of years ago but I think I looked into a really weird like financial metric and I just saw that it had changed quite a lot so I remember at one point they, they asked me a question on sort of what can I bring like how can I improve something to do with like profitability and I quoted something to do with their like operating profit and said it had dropped off 50 percent and that from my degree I thought it was probably because of this but they obviously knew more I think I highlighted COVID so I said like I'm assuming your operating costs have gone up because of COVID um and I think they were I mean I'd never obviously heard but I think that probably really impressed them because I don't think people even on the finance grad scheme probably looked into it to the extent where they were looking at individual costs. Um, but that was just because I was going down a commercial route. But if you wanted to just pick out something weird, I'd say just go through the website and maybe look at like the about page and look at like recent awards and things like that. Because they're things that other people will not quote. If you say something like maybe they won an, an award for envir- like environmental and sustainability in like 2018, you can maybe quote that and say that that's something like you're passionate about, if you obviously are. Um, I'm not encouraging anyone to go lying but yeah if you pick out something like that that's a bit peculiar I think you are just more memorable to be honest yeah definitely yeah um, for anyone who isn't aware many of the big employers have like a a press or a media section on their website as well which kind of promotes that exact kind of thing that they would like people to know about Um, so that can be a great way to find out about as you say kind of something a little bit random Excellent. I uh, can't see any other questions. Uh, oh, uh, we've just got one more. So, um, Jenny, what does your uh, day look like in terms of do you work in an office? Do you travel? Do you work from home? So um, luckily, they're really flexible in terms of the work from home. Um, and I tend to work. So we can basically choose is the answer to that question. But I tend to work at home three days a week. So I do Monday, Thursday, Friday at home. Um, and I go in the office Tuesday, Wednesday, which is quite nice because uh, I'm very bad at getting out of bed so Mondays just aren't aren't really a thing um Fridays it's just nice to be at home um and then I do on balance prefer work at home I just feel I'm actually more productive um but then the Tuesday Wednesday it's nice to split the week up so you have the little bit in the middle where ev- everyone tends to come in on those days as well but then yeah Monday Thursday Friday and work at home which works really well so nice to have the flexibility I must admit brilliant that's great thank you so much that's been really interesting I think um from other sessions that I've run uh I definitely heard people say that actually if you can get that breadth of exposure to businesses earlier on in your career it is easier because then you can choose what you want to specialize in and as you say you've got that oversight when you do work your way up the ladder whereas if you get to a certain point sometimes it can be much harder to retrain go back to the basics of that new area and then have to work your way up again so that's Mm. really great and are you joining us for the rest of the session Jonathan do you need to go off elsewhere and, and carry on your work elsewhere? I do, unfortunately. There is some Ben and Jerry's open in the freezer, unfortunately, I need to attend to. Um, off, but someone's but... got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, thank you very much for having me. And I think I filled out all my details. So I'm very happy to be contacted about anything whatsoever. So feel free to. Yes, we do have your details on the brochure again. So if you'd like to connect with Jonathan on LinkedIn, you do have the details on there. Thank you very much. Have a great rest of your day, Jonathan. Really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. It. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Okay, so last but by very no means least, we have Ross Arala. I hope I have pronounced that right, especially having asked you, but I apologise if I've butchered your name, Ross. Um, So thank you so much for joining us. Um, And I'll let you introduce yourself and get started. 
Hey, thank you very much. Can I just do an, an audio check? Can you can hear me? When we can hear you. Yes, uh, thank you. All right, I'm just going to share my screen as well. So I, I've rapidly had to change what I was going to talk about because um, most of what I was going to say, Vicky has said already, um, but, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like being put on the fly, hey? <laughs> Uh, there we go. So hopefully you can see there's uh, my, my presentation. So so I, I'm a local boy in Plymouth. Um, so yeah, I, I went to school here um, and got a, yeah, nothing special in terms of, of, of my results, but uh, it, it was okay. It allowed me to, to go on to university. Um, but what I particularly like about the accounting profession, oh, sorry, I'm Ross, by the way. Sorry, I missed that, didn't I? Uh, so yeah, I, I'm Ross. Um, so what, what I particularly like about the accounting profession is about the, the social mobility. Uh, so you know, I, I come from a not particularly a wealthy background, um, council estate in Plymouth, but uh, you know I went to a you know, reasonable school and that uh, allowed me to to be the first person in my family to go to university, which, which is really cool. Um, and at university, um, I went to Glasgow and, and studied nothing to do with accounting. Uh, like Vicky, I knew I wanted to be an accountant from a very early age, from 16. I knew it was the profession for me, um, but I didn't want to study accounting at university because uh, you, you don't need to. Uh, so yeah, I did a combined degree in classical civilization and maths uh, at, in Glasgow. Um, and that's that's an interesting thing in, in terms of the accounting profession that, you know, we have quite a wide variety of, of different backgrounds. In the office that I joined uh, from university, we had uh, a couple of mathematicians, there was a couple of geographers, there's a dentist, there's an engineer. And then this was this was really quite good because as a team, we had quite a lot of background knowledge in different industries. So, for example, the, my colleague who was an engineer, he would often go and work on clients who were in the engineering industry. So not only did we understand the accounting, we also understood their business as well. And being a, a, you know, a business advisor and understanding someone's business is, is, is really helpful. Um, when my colleague was a dentist, again, typically worked in a lot of the, the health clients that we had. And that that was really useful as well, uh, because you know sometimes when you when you if you're an auditor you might go into a business and they think well you know what do you really know about us do you understand what's going on and you know if you do that 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 helps so so for all of you guys I guess you're all doing something finance related um, and, and that that can can be helpful as well um, so when when I started um, I. I needed to do all of the, my professional exams because I had nothing relevant in my degree. I had to do all 15 exams to, to qualify. Um, but I'm guessing some of you, again, would, would have some exemptions. You wouldn't have to do all of the professional exams to, to, to go ahead. But just be warned, um, just because you have a, a finance degree, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can actually prepare a set of accounts in, in the real world. Um, so you just need to sort of set your expectations that when you arrive in your job, actually, there's still quite a lot of learning to do. Uh, my, my boss, he did a finance degree, for example, and uh, on his first day in, in an accounting firm, he realised that actually he was pretty clueless uh, because there was quite a, a difference between what he had studied uh, and then uh, what he had to do in, in practice. But for me, uh, I mean, my, my degree was, um, I'm not going to say completely um, useless, but perhaps in, irrelevant to my job. Uh, I, I've never been able to use any of my archaeology skills in, in any of my uh, accounting practice. Um, you know, I had a great time and I had lots of good skills in terms of you know, doing my analysis and to, be able to communicate with people. Um, but yeah, I've, I've not really used any of my, my, my degree skills at all. But that, that's fine. You know, it, it's, it was uh, still, it didn't prevent my access to the industry. And then, so when I left university, so I, I came back to Plymouth and I, I joined uh, PricewaterhouseCoopers. So this is you know, one of the, the top four firms. And again, I, I would you know, agree completely with what Vicky said, that it doesn't really matter what size firm you want to join. Um, you can get lots and lots of good experience. So I joined a really big firm, but because it was in Plymouth, it was a very, very small office. And so I had a bit of a sort of a, a mixture of, of all the advantages. Um, I know that some of my colleagues who are, say, in the London office, they spent quite a lot of the first few months um, in, in their sort of a new job doing very, sort of, well, shall I say, menial tasks, sort of photocopying, lots of filing. Um, and for, for many people, that was a bit of a shock to the system. You, you come out of university thinking, wow, I've got this amazing degree. I'm going to do some fantastic things. And then for the first couple of months, you're actually doing something quite low level. Uh, because you know, it takes time for you to, to learn the skills to be able to sort of do more difficult things. 
Whereas for me, I was pretty much thrown in at the deep end as soon as I arrived in the small office, because uh, it was just a smaller team and we just got lots of experience much more quickly. So um, I think again, if you're going to join a, a mid-tier firm or even a smaller firm, um, yeah, I think it's more likely you'll be doing quite a lot of key important things very, very quickly, just because of the, the, the size of the business you'd be working for. Um, so yeah, that, that wasn't the, the office. I just, just managed to find a, a generic PwC picture uh, to put on my presentation now. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it was you know, really a, a wide variety of, of experience. I also joined as an auditor and yeah, as Vicky said, yeah, it was fantastic. Every, every day was different. Every week was different. It, it was lots of experience and also lots of understanding how, how a business works. And that, 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 I thought that was really, really important. Now, notice on my, my slide there, I've said yeah, I did an apprenticeship. So there's lots of debate in there about, you know, should I go to university? Should I do an apprenticeship? Well, actually, if you want to go into the accounting profession, uh, doing both is pretty normal. So, yeah, you may have your degree, but uh, you, it's very likely that you will have a three year apprenticeship, possibly two year apprenticeship for you to get your professional qualification. So uh, it's, it's unlikely that you'll be able to escape a, a, an apprenticeship. So for me, I had a, a three year apprenticeship where you know, I had to do all of my 15 exams, uh, plus learn about ethical practice and get lots of practical work experience. And, and, and that's that's really important. All that experience is, is so key. So, yes, yeah, so I had my, my three years of, of apprenticeship and I, I carried on um, you know, after my apprenticeship as well. So I spent seven years in audit. Um, there are two different types of audit, which I don't know whether you've, you've done this in your, your studies, but there, there's external audit where you are trying to you know, give some confidence that a company's accounts are OK. But there's also internal audit as well, where you go into a business, you look at their processes and how they do things and try to suggest improvements. So Katie, you talked about consultancy. Well, that, that was the area that I, I really enjoyed is going into organisations and trying to make things better. So, you know, um, you know, this was ages ago that I did this, so I'm sure it's okay for me to, to share the sort of businesses that I was working on when, when I was uh, an auditor here in Plymouth. Um, again, you can see in the, 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 sort of the bottom of the picture, so like Vicky, I did some work at the university as well. Um, but some of these uh, experiences were, were really amazing. So, you know, when I was working with Kawasaki, for example, you know, so I'm not an engineer in any way, but um, looking at their production process and looking at how they did things, it, it was really, really, really interesting. And you know, again, on, on the left of the screen, working at Vicebring, so you know, the bed manufacturer and Ernie Settle, you know, it was just, again, fascinating. Their, their most expensive bed retails at about £25,000. Um, so just understanding the process of, you know, how do you make a bed that costs £25,000? Yeah, it's just really, really interesting to, to understand all of those business processes. Um, I also did some work at Derrick Hospital, for example, and in terms of some of the consulting work there. So, yeah, I managed to, to earn the hospital extra sort of £30,000 a year. So they, they had some processes there that weren't really working very effectively. Um, and you know, just as a, as a visitor, I was able to be objective, look at their processes and just spot, well, that this isn't working very well. And, you know, they, they couldn't really see that because they're just so involved in the day to day affairs and what's going on. But yes, yeah, someone from outside could just spot that problem. And, you know, I managed to get them some extra money. So, yeah, that, that, that I found was really, really great. So lots of job satisfaction, you know, adding value to an organization. Um, yeah, I like to think as an accountant, I managed to save some lives just by earning them that, that extra money every year. Um, yeah, I didn't actually save some lives, but yeah, I like to think I, I contributed to that. So um, that, that was, that was you know, again, really, really interesting. Lots of different experience there. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and then after that, I, I moved into education. So I worked for an organization called BPP. I mean, I don't know, Vicky, whether you, you qualified with BPP or you went to a, a, another organization for your training. Uh, but so BPP, one of the, the sort of the main uh, trainers for uh, accounts qualifications uh, in, in the country. Although um, I, I didn't work in the UK, I, I decided I want to go and uh, work in Eastern Europe. So there are a, a variety of uh, options are available uh, once you qualify and, and traveling is one of them. 
you know, can I, I would agree with Vicky about you doing a, a bit of traveling is, is a, a very good idea. It really broadens your skill base and helps with your resilience. Um, but you know, I just couldn't afford that when, when I was younger. But um, I thought, well, well, how about if I get the employer to pay for all my traveling? Um, so you know, when I started at PwC, my, my ambition was to work in each continent, um, which sadly I, I've not achieved. Um, you know, I've got I've got kids now and, and they're just sort of stopping me from doing anything really. But but anyway, um, I, I managed to achieve five continents so far, um, but realizing that perhaps getting those other two, you know, Australia and Antarctica may be a bit of an issue now. Um, so when I was younger, I did see a job advert for the British Antarctic Survey. And they did say that uh, about six months would be spent in Antarctica, but uh, yeah, that's probably not an option for me now. So yeah, I, I've managed to do quite a bit of traveling. Um, so if that's something that you are interested in, so being an accountant can open the, the doors for that because uh, every business needs accountants. Um, yeah, the, the rules for preparing your accounts may vary from place to place, but in general, I have the rules are basically the, the, the same. Um, and you know, people need accountants where, wherever. So you know, I, I've had some pretty amazing experiences uh, traveling all over the world and supporting accountants. Um, and sometimes I've had to sort of pinch myself thinking, am, am I really doing this? Um, now, I mentioned your know, resilience because sometimes things are hard. Um, so, so for example, yeah, when I was working in South Africa, I was sort of traveling to a client and my, my car broke down in the middle of nowhere and there was no mobile phone reception. And um, yeah, that, that was a, a bit of a struggle. Um, in Ukraine, I'd been stopped by the police where they just tried to bribe me or arrest me. And yeah, as, a, as a chartered accountant, yeah, I need to have the highest standards of integrity. So there's no way I was going to pay a bribe to this scumbag policeman. Um, but actually, I was pretty close to being carted away in the truck. And I was thinking afterwards, why did I put myself through that? You know, I could have just given him a few grivnia and he would have just gone away. But, you know, all the ethical training that was sort of... Uh, brainwashing me in all my many years as an accountant. I thought, no, I can't do this. But um, anyway, perhaps I should have. Um, and then, you know, just, you know, when I was working in Macedonia, for example, uh, having to avoid mortars being uh, you know, sent into the town because the, 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 the Albanian rebels were not very happy with the political system um, and riots in Athens. So, so all of these things that we don't necessarily see in, in Plymouth, um, you, know, you, you think, uh, yeah, how do I cope with this? Yeah, just, just, just being prepared for all the, these difficult issues. Um, and it sort of just builds that, that ability to sort of cope and think of new solutions and you know, how, how are you going to, to, to solve all these different problems. Um, so yeah, that, that, that is, is, is really good. Uh, one of my colleagues, uh, sorry, one of my friends rather, is, is a pilot and he's really frustrated with me that I've been to more countries as an accountant than he has as a commercial airline pilot. Um, but anyway, so that, that, that's, that's pretty cool. Um, so that, that's what I wanted to show you in terms of, um, you know, what, what, uh, so I'm going to stop sharing now. Oh, I don't do that. Oh, well, I can't. Uh, it should be at the bottom of, uh, probably the top of your screen should be a little red. Oh, button. there we are. You got it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to do is say something a bit different in terms of what Vicky was talking about. So, so for the past 20 years, I, I've not been working in audit. I've been working in industry, or, uh, but in a variety of roles. You know, my, my main role is that I'm an educator. But you know, I, I've also been in charge of the various businesses. So I was managing director of our training office in, in Bulgaria, for example. So there I was you know, having to, to run a business and, and my accounting skills and my business skills were, were really, really handy then. So all the stuff that I learned about running a business from looking at clients you know, allowed me to, to make some well, hopefully good decisions. So you know, I had to think about your know, forecasting. I had to think about employing people. I had to think about um, what well, preparing the accounts for the business as well, but also just making decisions. You know, should I employ somebody? You know, thinking about what what are what is the forecast demand for the business? Can I afford to employ somebody? And just having those those accounting skills and that that sort of numerical skills uh, really supported the, those business decisions. Um, one thing I think is useful to point out as well, that many people think of accountants as being sort of in a numbers job. And 
probably when I joined the profession, it, yes, it, it was. But I think today it's it's quite different uh, because computers do lots of the number crunching for you. And, you know, Vicky talked about that earlier, the, the technology aspects of the job. So I'd say that in today's accounting world, being a people person is uh, very important. And I've certainly seen sort of all the, the, the new people joining uh, the profession that, that I'm, I'm helping to train. There's definitely a, a change in recruiting. Um, there's a change in the people who are joining. Um, and there's you know, very much thinking about the, the social skills and people skills. So you know, I, I, don't know, I don't know whether you've joined a variety of student societies and so on, but I would recommend that you do and you attend networking events um, and you get to you know, talk to strangers. You know, that, that's a skill. Um, and a skill that I don't think I'm particularly good at. I'm, I'm a bit of an introvert. Um, you know, when, when I was living abroad, uh, we'd often be invited to by, you know, by the embassy to go and visit um, them and for the Queen's birthday party, for example. And just being able to network and talk to strangers is, is something that, that's you know, quite, quite useful. So just force yourself, if you're not very comfortable with those sorts of things, to go and, go and talk to people you don't know. So I think I've probably run out of time now, Katie. So, but yeah, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to to try and answer them. That's great, Ross. Thank you so much. I think one of the things that has come through very clearly, I think, from all of you speakers today, is that um, yeah, accountancy and finance might sometimes have this uh, reputation for being a bit dull or, as you say, very numbers focused. And actually, the opportunities to travel from it, the people side of things so so important especially if, I guess if you're going in as a consultant or an auditor and uh, you know you need people to be honest and open with you and share information that uh, is on the books or that might not be on the books but something they know is coming up that you need that skill to unpick that um, so that's really great thank you are there any questions that anyone would like to ask Ross again feel free to unmute or pop them in the chat if so while we're waiting for people to do that, potentially, I'd like to ask, actually, um, what what was it that caused you to kind of um, decide to go from being in practice to educating? Um, so when I was in practice, I, I did manage to travel a little bit there. So, yes, I, you know, I had a few foreign secondments. You know, I went to three different, four or five different countries in practice. And I had the travel bug. And uh, one of my former colleagues uh, wrote to me and said, oh, I've um, set up this, this business in Eastern Europe. Do you fancy coming to help? And um, the temptation was too good. Ah, so networking again, coming through strongly. It's not sometimes what you know, it's who you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Brilliant. Um, Jenny would like to know how competitive are vacancies for new graduates? Uh, for new graduates, well, it depends where you want to work, I suppose. So at the moment, yeah, um, so I work in education and so employers are asking us about whether they have any, uh, if we know anybody. So yeah, we're, we're currently recruiting for about seven people uh, for, for graduates. So yeah, they're, they're um, you know, at the moment, employers are, are looking. Uh, the southwest has sort of struggled a little bit over the past couple of years um but yeah there, there's at the moment i'd say that there are more vacancies than applicants good time to be looking then yeah yes because that if we do go into a recession that may change over the next few years guys so just be aware of that as well well, well, well having said that you know every business needs uh, accountants so if you are starting up you need an accountant to advise you if you're failing you need an accountant to advise you uh, so it doesn't matter whether it's a, a recession or, or where we're booming, um, accountants are in demand. That's a very good point. Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Any other questions that anyone would like to ask Ross? Just give it a moment in case anyone's typing one. I would just, as a final question, if there aren't any more, I'd like to know how you managed to get out of the uh, clinch with your car <laughs> in the middle of was it Africa you said um it was, it was really interesting because my, my, my rough guide said uh do not give lifts to anybody um in this particular area because it's incredibly dangerous um so yeah, don't pick up any hitchhikers uh but yeah it's just some some passing people help me out thank goodness for that <laughs> might have had a very different outcome otherwise yeah <laughs> Oh, brilliant. That's wonderful. Thank you so much um, for ending the session with such interesting uh, stuff. And, you know, you never know, you might still get to go to Antarctica uh, one day, but uh, <laughs> uh, 
as, as somewhere I'd like to go as well. So uh, I'll maybe see you there at some point in the future. Um, <laughs> but thank you so much to everyone who's been involved today. Um, uh, Vicky, I know you're still with us as well. And thank you both so much for joining us and sharing your stories. I think that's been incredibly interesting and really useful and hopefully helped um, people to understand, you know, the importance of these roles, where they can lead you. Um, as you both said, you know, actually having that understanding of um, the financial side and therefore the risk side of things as well is so important and really does underpin running a business. So maybe we have some future CEOs sat here today. Um, I did just want to share my screen one last time with you to let you know about this session that is coming up next week. Um, this isn't being run through the university, um, but it's being run directly through PwC and they're doing a session on well-being at work so if you are interested in that please do feel free to take a look on my career for the details of to, uh, how to how to sign up um, and that's taking place on campus but thank you all so much again for attending today um, I hope you found the session useful and interesting and uh, as you say there are contact details on the brochure if you would like to connect with our speakers after um, and I think we will on that note stop the recording and